Today we're looking at the Battle of Agincourt 1415 and we're considering um, how much had changed in the nature of warfare um, towards the end of the period we're studying at the moment which is 1250 to 1500. So the Battle of Agincourt was fought in northern France between the armies of England and France. Uh, this was part of the Hundred Years' War which lasted between 1337 and 1453 and was Basically the idea of English kings claiming to be recognised also at the same time to be kings of King of France. Um, and this is where, in 1415, the English king Henry V of Shakespeare fame led a military campaign to France um, to try and stake his claim to be the king of France as well as the king of England. Now, we're not going to spend much time looking at Henry V now. Um, there is obviously plenty on Firefly about Henry V, um, about his character, about his personality and what sort of king he was. We will touch on this later, of course, because one of the key ingredients of battles is the role of individuals. And we will look later at how Henry um, helped this battle to progress. As you can see, Henry V's campaign in northern France was an attempt to capture and control land there. And it all started um, in August 1415, where he landed at the port of Harfleur um, and spent five weeks trying to seize that port. Um, and this took the form of a typical medieval siege. So the idea of capturing Harfleur was to find himself a secure base for an expedition across northern France. And the idea would be, which was typical in medieval times, was to plan to seize French castles and raid French settlements, settlements along the way with a fast-moving army. Um, they would destroy property, they would seize booty. Um, he would then plan to negotiate with the French king for territory. Um, by the time he'd seized Harfleur, it was early October and he left troops to protect the town and set out for the English stronghold at Calais, the English port, with the plan to take refuge for the winter. Now, Henry chose to march to Calais rather than sail. Um, the idea was he wanted to show the French that he was not scared of them. But along the way, he was shadowed by the French army um, who were trying to force him into a battle. And during this march, Conditions got bad for Henry and his men. There was an outbreak of dysentery um, that had already affected men in Harfleur. And therefore, as Henry's march stretched into its third week across northern France, wintry weather, his men became ill, they became weak and tired. And eventually, the French army trapped the English and Henry was forced to accept the battle um, at Agincourt. In terms of the location at Agincourt, um, you can see that um, um, Henry decided to fight this on the road to Calais, but on um, a location which certainly suited him. Um, for example, the, um, the, the ploughed ground that um, he chose to fight on um, was very soft. Um, there'd been heavy rains recently, so it was difficult to walk across, which would help prevent a speedy, powerful attack by the French cavalry. So the ground was an advantage to England's defensive position, as well as also um, the fact that his flanks were protected by woodland on either side. And the battlefield really sort of narrowed just ahead of the English forces, which again would be useful for defensive reasons um, against an advancing army. So if we switch diagrams to the map above you can see the wooded land or the, the woodland on the right and on the left you can see the sort of the narrow battlefield um, on the road to Calais and you can see how the English are arranged and the French are arranged. In terms of numbers you need to appreciate that the English army was considerably outnumbered um, especially in nights by the French men. We are not entirely sure how many French were there at Agincourt, but certainly you can see that um, the English had somewhere in the region of about 7,000 infantrymen, mostly longbowmen. And in terms of knights, um, men-at-arms, it says on this diagram here, 
Henry only really had at his disposal somewhere upwards towards 2,000 men. So the advantage in terms of the location is definitely with the English. They've chosen the ground. They've got their flanks protected. It's a narrow battlefield. It's a good defensive position that Henry's got. Um, but in terms of sheer weight of numbers, um, the advantage certainly is with the French. Just one other thing that Henry did um, to help his defensive position was he ordered his archers to make long sharpened stakes from wood and ram these into the ground in front of his forces um, to act as a barrier against a cavalry charge. So it really is the case that Henry set himself out a defensive position and awaited the French attack. Despite Henry V's hopes, the French army did not attack. Um, the English army wasn't strong enough to attack the French, of course, and was very worried about French reinforcements too, so they could not afford to wait too much. So Henry decided to move his forces slightly more forward, and particularly some of his archers into the trees at either side of the battlefield in an attempt to provoke um, a French attack. Now, initially, the firing of arrows by English archers in the woodland on either side of the battlefield, that's known as galling. It's um, an attempt to anger your enemy and provoke them into attacking you, which is, of course, what Henry wanted. Th this tactic was seen as quite unchivalrous at the time and therefore against the codes of war, um, but it did anger and frustrate the French. As well as this, Henry also started to pour some larger numbers of archers forward that began firing a storm of arrows into the French army. Now the French had no way to defend themselves against this um, pretty intense um, rain of arrows. And as a result of which, this did entice the French to rush to attack. And they sent their cavalry forward, um, slowed across the... Um, by the difficult ground, the, the, the soft mud that started to churn up under the hooves of the horses um, and the weight of the French cavalry moving forward. Um, and therefore this attack did fail um, to defeat the English archers, who of course, if you remember, were still protected behind their stakes that they'd driven into the ground. Things then got worse for the French. Um, the French got off their horses, they dismounted, and their knights moved forward, um, but struggled in their advance as well. Um, they were slowed by the ground, which was very muddy. They were tired by walking in their armour, and they were under a constant barrage of arrows um, from the English. Now, the battlefield does narrow just before the position of the English army, so the French knights did become very bunched together, very crushed together, uh, which made it difficult for them to wield their huge double-handed swords in the fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat with the English knights that ensued. Um, the English long longbowmen are um, no longer able to fire arrows for risk of hitting their own men in the crush of close combat. They joined in, joined in the fighting using very primitive weapons such as daggers and stones. Eventually, over time, the French casualties became larger and larger with thousands killed or taken prisoner. Now, while this is going on, there are a couple of other incidents of note that happened at Agincourt. Um, Henry controversially made the decision to slaughter some of the French prisoners that he'd, he'd taken, which again was seen as unchivalrous and against the code of conduct of, of warfare in those times. But Henry's viewpoint was is that um, the English just didn't have the numbers to cope with looking after these prisoners and fighting at the same time. He was still worried about reinforcements, so he made the decision to slaughter uh, the French prisoners. Also as well, the other incident that goes on is, as you, as you can see on the map just here, there is the English baggage train where the supplies were. There was a French attempt to capture the baggage train and also to come at the, um, the English forces from behind. Um, but this failed um, as well. And eventually um, it was becoming pretty obvious that the English were winning and the French were being defeated. 
and as a result of this, French forces withdrew from the field and the English army had won the battle. Now, it's not possible really to know the precise numbers of casualties. There were no records made, but the French did suffer serious losses, perhaps over 3,000 dead, whereas English losses were much lower, probably about 450. And Henry V's victory at Agincourt, very, very famous victory, depicted in Shakespeare, of course, enabled him to renew his military campaigns against France in the following years, which eventually led to him being recognised as heir to the French throne. Um, of course, his, his death and subsequent English military defeats meant that this was never actually realised in practice. Now, on to the important stuff, really, um, to see whether there was much change in warfare in the Middle Ages or whether there are elements of continuity in all of this. So there's a number of points really to be made here um, to see about whether the Battle of Agincourt was actually typical of warfare in medieval times. Um, the first point really to be made is um, that Agincourt was pretty typical of how English armies fought at the time. The composition of the army by now was dominated by longbowmen um, a ratio really of three long bowmen to one knight. Um, and this is the idea really that we've seen the demise of the mounted knight, that long bowmen are beginning to dominate the English army at the time, the composition of the army, um, at the expense of mounted knights. Knights now tended to fight more dismounted than on horses. Um, in the centre of the battlefield and with archers typically on the flanks. So that is really a change that has developed over this period of history in that we move towards longbow and away from the use of mounted cavalry and knights um, in the old sort of manner of fighting from horses. As well as that also, one of the things that you can see um, about Agincourt was the recruitment of the men who fought at Agincourt was pretty typically now uh, through signed indentures or contracts in which payment was promised in return for military service. Positions of command were as usual at Agincourt given to the highest ranking noblemen so that's not really changed um, across the period 1250 to 1500 so people like the Duke of York um, were soldiers that were had a position of command given to them by um, monarchs and kings of the day. What's quite unusual, though, at Agincourt for Henry V, of course, to or, or, uh, make the order to slaughter prisoners, um, but, of course, that was driven by practical considerations at the time, rather than a complete disregard for chivalry and the conventions of respecting and ransoming prisoners. You can also see at Agincourt that it began with a five-week siege of Harfleur. So sieges were still a feature of warfare during this period. And also the taking of castles and key towns um, to use as secure bases is also common during this time in warfare. Um, there were also common complaints during this time on the experience of warfare for civilians. And what I mean by that is the idea that you could point to the English army, them, them marching through Normandy, that the soldiers would take food and would burn homes along the way, through which civilians, local populations, would suffer. Though having said that, Henry V's army was, at, was actually more restrained than was typical at the time. And there are accounts of him hanging soldiers um, and punishing soldiers for treating civilians badly. Um, during the, the expedition in France. The battle at Agincourt lasted about three hours, um, which again is typical. You'll probably recognise that that was the same sort of um, time as, as, as what happened at Falkirk back in 1298. You also perhaps recognise that the location of battle was hugely important in deciding victory at this time, all right, it didn't necessarily work at Falkirk um, for the Scots and William Wallace, but the location of the battle here and the defensive positions that Henry took, you can probably see were hugely important in helping him to win the battle in this case. Perhaps one of the changes, though, at 
Agincourt um, that has happened during this, this period of history is by the 15th century, knights would have worn plate armour um, suits instead, instead of steel. Um, plate armour armor had gradually come to replace chain mail during the 14th century. And the reason that this was possible was because methods of steel production had developed. And plate armour obviously offered greater protection than chain mail, but it was very heavy. Um, it did sometimes impede movement, particularly on the ground that you saw at Agincourt. Um, and the most commonly worn style of um, armour at the time, certainly in terms of helmets, was the bassinet helmets. Um, B-A-S-C-I-N-E-T, which protected the entire face. And that's typically the sort of the knight's armour where you would have hinged, movable, pointed visors as a helmet. As for Henry, Henry V himself, we do need to consider his role at Agincourt. Um, in terms of things that went wrong for him, you would point out firstly that his march across France was risky and weakened his army. And secondly, you might point out that he was outmaneuvered by the French and forced to fight a battle that he really did want to avoid against superior forces. But having said that, there are some points where you can suggests that his leadership was strong. His choice of where to fight the battle in terms of taking up a good defensive position. He certainly placed his men well. He used his archers and his long bows really as the decisive force at Agincourt. As well as that, he was also very brave. Some of this is propaganda by Shakespeare, of course, in his um, St Crispin's Day speech, which is documented on Firefly and on the internet. Um, but several of the people who there do describe Henry as fighting side by side with his men in hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat on the battlefield. Um, and he did actually wear his crown on his helmet in battle, which did identify him as a particular target. Um, which was, of course, incredibly brave and really quite unusual for a king um, to do that um, at that time in medieval warfare. So that's Agincourt, done and dusted. Um, one of the things that you need to realise about this, um, about case studies like Falkirk and Agincourt, is you use them to give examples of warfare in this period, in the Middle Ages, between 1250 and 1500 you can perhaps use Agincourt to point out any continuities in warfare um, over this period and also perhaps point out one or two of the changes um, that also took place during this period. You will probably notice, of course, that there is more continuity during this period in the nature of warfare um, than there is change. Um, but you can rewind this presentation you can use the textbook to get notes down about this, which of course you can then learn to put forward in your essays um, in response to exam questions.